reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Welcome to our June 1st meeting. And please note the council's in full attendance. First item on our agenda is, uh, of course, items from council. Does anyone, there is one item there obviously in the flood, but does anyone have anything else they'd like to talk about first? Okay, seeing no one. Um, and if you think of something, just please let us know or before we finish. Uh, of course, the last week has been interesting with the, the, the flood and the rising river waters. Uh, Rick McBriar's here. Uh, with the our EOC emergency operations center of course police chief and fire chief are here and they've been heavily involved so with that I'd like to ask you just give us an update on on what's occurred over the last seven days and okay, great so um, so once again it's Rick McBurn with emergency operations center or Victoria emergency management um, so I got James foot to bring up some graphics for me here um, kind of set the stage a little bit first part of May um, we started in on a very wet uh, pattern throughout the state of Texas. First week of May brought in substantial rains. Uh, second week of May, uh, 10th through the 15th, brought in some more substantial <coughs> rains, which then set the foundation for a three to six, <coughs> 300 to 600 percent soil saturation in our watershed. And our watershed is just around the uh, San Marcos, Wimberley, uh, New Braunfels area. And so then what happened over the weekend, uh, right before that, we were already increasing our river levels uh, up to around 28. Uh, into almost a major category flood stage, um, which set the stage for us to already have uh, inundated uh, riverine basins and things like that. And then the Memorial Day weekend, we had a flash flood that occurred just north up in the Blanco region, north of Wimberley, uh, that brought 6 to 12 inches of rain. I think everybody probably saw that on the Memorial Day weekend. And so that set the uh, uh, major foundation for us to where all that water was going to be coming down towards us. Um, James, do you have the other slide? And there's the, uh, the rainfall totals for May 23rd to 24th. Uh, you can see it actually, I can't see the graphic on the white, but uh, a substantial amount of rain there. And so with the rivers already uh, in max capacity uh, into moderate for us down in, in this region, uh, it quickly moved us into the possibility of going to a major flood category. Uh, and our major flood category is right at 29.5 for us. It comes out of the banks and starts causing some inundation problems into the low line areas. Um, you can go back to the graphic. And so there's some footage here. Um, it just shows you um, that James has pulled from the video that we had uh, from a drone that had flown through the Riverside Park and areas. And so he was able to capture a few photos there. So the inundation that we had. Uh, meeting with the command and policy staff on uh, Memorial Day itself on the, uh, that Monday, we felt it was very prudent for us to go ahead and do a, what we call a disaster declaration. And the disaster declaration sets the foundation for us to move forward with uh, implementation of all of our emergency management plan, uh, any of its 22 associated annexes, and also gives us the capability that if we had to prohibit movement in and out of uh, certain affected areas, we can do just that. Um, sets somewhat of a foundation for us to move forward with uh, uh, possible FEMA reimbursement, but it's not the, that's not the means for a disaster declaration. The disaster declaration gives us the ability to actually uh, mandatory evacuate somebody if we need so or needed to uh, and so with uh, that Monday we set that foundation because we felt it was very prudent for us to look at the complexity of the problem that may be uh, getting ready to happen to Victoria and how complex that problem is going to get for us and so we definitely looked at that at a close uh, with a close eye and uh, decided that we want to do the declaration and then go into full operation mode for the emergency operations center which we did uh, and have been that way all the way through this past weekend. Uh, now we're going to be start moving into what we call a recovery mode as the waters start to recede. Uh, we've done some preliminary damage assessments and we'll be doing damage assessments with the infrastructure, uh, public works on both sides, uh, city and the county. So that's kind of a quick snapshot. Um, feel free if you want to come by the Mercy Operations Center. We have this video in its entirety. It's, it's pretty, uh, pretty awesome to watch actually to see amount of uh, rain that we received and the floodwaters that came down towards towards us so now we we do not need to continue the declaration no sir we're going to remove that it's on the agenda that's, that's not correct. required there's no need so by de declaring the initial one that set the stage for whatever legal requirements as you described so yes, okay indeed 
Very good. So we will not be doing Council C1. <coughs> Where's the best place for uh, public to get info? Just the city website still? Mm -hmm. Do you still have that website. banner across the top? Yes. Where well, there's phone numbers in there and whatnot? Okay. And then OC is doing continually updates on press releases, and it's out there. So. Okay. We'll show. Facebook, yeah, that's been uh, productive, it appears. But and as we move over the next few days, I know there's a lot of interest in when Riverside Park is going to open up. Kobe, we're going to look tomorrow morning to see kind of where we're at with the river going down, what we might can get open up, but no guarantees. Uh, and I know uh, the pump house is another. When is it going to be able to open back up again? We'll do that evaluation tomorrow to see um, what we can open up. The street department, Public Works, has been opening up streets moving barricades back as they're constantly evaluating those areas where we can get things opened up so um, that's ongoing for the next several days the river's gonna still be in a flood stage yes. but it'd be a moderate be a moderate um, for probably the next week or so so we're gonna have to be careful uh, and we've got to get in Riverside to assess damages to see what happened to the roads with the water over it to make sure it's gonna be safe for vehicles to travel so but we'll do that as quickly as possible, but at the same time keeping, you know, the safety of the public in mind when we're doing that. So it's very important. Uh, and I know the zoo, Texas Zoo is kind of waiting to hear from us uh, on when we think we might get Riverside back opened up. So I've told her, you know, here's our plan for tomorrow, and we'll be in contact with Amanda Roach at the zoo. Uh, she's losing revenue every day they're closed, uh, and so I know she's eager to get it, but also very, understands the need to make sure it's safe. So I'll kind of rem we need to still remind people, though, they should not go around barricades, either in vehicles or on foot. They're there for a reason. Uh, we encourage people not to play in the water. It's contaminated, so it's not real healthy for people to be playing in the flood water. And, uh, you know, we'll, again, we'll move quickly. Rick, can you think of any other reminders that the public... No, it, our preliminary damage assessment is only done by a visual inspection of the, of the roadways that were inundated. And, um, and so if we have homeowners that had received damages in their home to please give us a call at the flood hotline or call the emergency operations center um, and that way we can document that accordingly and we can make sure that we uh, move forward with that and so so no one should enter the park either it's around a barricade or any other means that's right yeah. vehicle four-wheeler and police department well i mean it's easy to walk Bicycle. in walk in from <coughs> some other vantage points but pd will cite people as i understand they it. have the capacity capability it's, to do that yes. okay the signage and whatnot's made it pretty clear mm -hmm. to, to not be in there yeah. with pedestrian or whatever the case so it's, it's a little dangerous still so I, I want to brag a little bit you know this is Rick's been the uh, emergency manager now for how long Rick uh, since November November so he led us through this incident very well also need to brag on the our city staff did a um, tremendous job uh, you know constantly out doing what they needed to do but we also work very closely with the county and the county staff, and I would uh, venture to say that uh, not every city and county can say that we have the relationship together to make sure that we make sure these events are well handled, but we do work well with the county, and uh, so it's good to have that partnership. Um, Rick serves as the county city. It's a partnership with the county for Rick to be the emergency manager for both entities, and it works very well. So. We, well said it went well. well very well said. so good job thank you for everybody's help so it's been a great great adventure so any other questions i've got uh we haven't experienced any significant obstruction downstream that has caused the flow the the cf the cfs cubic feet per second i noticed it was up to about sixty thousand. so we're not seeing any experience downstream keeping the water from flowing no just simply water in front of water and so we're waiting for it to it's a lot of water. On it. It's just a lot of water. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. Okay. Items from council. Anything else? <coughs> Think of anything? If not, we'll just move on. We'll move forward to our work session. So we'll uh, turn it over to you and you start your budget presentations. Everyone should have a green binder to get oh, the behind me. <laughs> take home and then the handouts all ready for each yeah. department. Were we going to ask for citizens' communication? Oh, yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, let's go ahead and open the uh, citizens' communication portion of our meeting. Anyone like to come forward and speak about anything at all? Now's the time. Just please limit your comments to five minutes or less out of courtesy to everyone else. Um, and we will be here tomorrow.
for, I don't know when this will be televised, but we'll be here the next three days in a row, just FYI. So. Okay, seeing no one coming forward, we'll close citizens' communication. And now we'll move ahead to our work session. I mean, I just have a few comments before uh, Dana is going to be the first presenter for the library. But, you know, so, uh, you've all, six of you have been through this before. It's new for Jan. So, uh, but just to kind of set the stage, what we do at this stage is the department heads for the large departments will come up, talk about their budget. What we're after is direction you know if you see or hear something that you're not comfortable with or not in alignment with then we can do a course correction on what we're presenting you will get the entire budget the first meeting in august that's when you know you'll get that three inch document that goes into detail for each budget but tonight this week it's more of direction this is what they're proposing in their budget uh, so the other thing i'll r remind you we're doing it just a little different Gilbert's going to finish up on Thursday night. We decided to wait and talk about revenues and expenses at the very last. We're going to do budget budgets first, and then Gilbert's going to finish up with where we're at with revenues, kind of bring it all together. So, But again, um, this is preliminary. Numbers will probably change after we get the certified tax <coughs> roll in July. But Gilbert does a really good job estimating what he thinks those revenues are going to be. But there's always subject to change, so that's it's still preliminary at this point. So, um, any questions of that, or where we're, I, we've got. I'm gonna try to do four tonight. I promised you we'd do two hours, no more. So if we, if it's we're at an hour and 30 minutes, and only three's been done, we'll wait and do that fourth one another night. So we, we're only scheduling one budget conversation tomorrow night since we have a council, and that's with Public Works tomorrow night because it'll probably take a little longer than normal. So, like I said earlier, Dana's first, so. Come on, Dana. <laughs> well, good evening, Council. I have the privilege tonight of kicking off this week of budget presentations. And I also wanted to um, just uh, introduce my assistant director, Catherine Mulebrad, is here with me. And she has joined me this evening, and I wanted to recognize her for the excellent work she's done on a big project that you funded last year. Um, we have been working this whole last year on updating our library material security process, and that was called RIFID, if you remember me saying that, radio frequency ID project last year during budget sessions. We have a new security gate, new patron self-check machine, and the project has really, really run very smoothly as far as implementation. Tonight I'm going to present a brief overview of library services, strategic plan, budget proposal for next year, and then an eye to future projects. And I'm not on the right slide here. First one. Let's see. That was quick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, Victoria Public Library is open 61 hours per week. We have about 4,400 people who walk through our doors on an average week. That equals out to about 230,000 um, people who walk through the doors in a year. We serve about 48,000 cardholders and additional customers of the city, the county, and the surrounding area at one physical location and through our website. We have 27 full-time and five part-time employees. In 2014, we checked out 373,000 physical and e-book items, which was about a 10% increase over the number of items that were checked out in 2010. And the graph at the bottom of this slide just shows how we've moved increasing that over the last five years. We provide a variety of services from children's programming access to popular reading materials, both in physical and electronic format, computer and technology classes, workforce development and training with assistance on resume development and online job applications, access to computers, printers, and Wi-Fi, and community gathering and meeting space. The library works with multiple community partners, <coughs> including Victoria Independent School District, Head Start, Workforce Development, Victoria Business and Education Coalition, 
UHB and Victoria College, Children's Discovery Museum, Texas Independent Film Festival, United Way, the Bach Festival. That's just to name a few of our partners in the community. Our guiding principles are outlined in the library strategic plan, which I presented to this council. I try to do at least an a annual update on that. That plan was developed through the work of a community process, including meetings and feedback from community leaders, library staff, library advisory board, and uh, the Friends of Victoria Public Library. The plan was developed in 2011 and updated and revised in 2014. Our five main strategic goals are listed on this slide. They are early literacy, information and technology fluency, cultural awareness, lifelong learning, and providing access to a variety of popular materials in a variety of formats for all ages. So why are we so busy and involved with many different community organizations? Because we are an equalizer in accessing information and technology for those who can't afford to or don't know how to wade through the massive amounts of facts and knowledge available to them. We are a community builder in helping parents with children of all ages making connections with each other and the resources needed to help their children develop early literacy skills and continue to succeed in school even during the summer months. And we are a space for community building and meeting. We serve a diverse clientele, every age, income level, ethnicity, physical ability, providing access to a full range of tools and services that allows our users to live better, learn independently, find jobs, and improve skills. Now moving on to budget. Dana, before you move on, uh, yes. talking about your community partners and early literacy, you might want to mention the day of caring with the United Way. Yes. You do that later. Okay. Um, you would like me to go ahead and mention that now? or Sure. Sure. Um, we have a really wonderful opportunity this summer with United Way, Victoria County, and we are planning a, um, we're calling it Back to School Bonanza. Um, Cliff, Clifford Grimes of United Way is planning his day of caring on Thursday, August the 13th. That morning, his volunteers will be coming in and preparing some literacy packets for all the second grade students in Victoria County region that the United Way serves. Um, they will be assembling those packets in the morning and having their program that morning. In the afternoon, we are going to be doing a variety of activities for children from, um, we're inviting a lot of the uh, preschools clear up till about the middle school age and their parents for what we're calling it's kind of like a literacy fair idea we will be focusing on different things that make reading and learning fun for example readers theater we're going to um, we have Scott Moen on board and uh, theater Victoria is going to be, be doing an example of what readers theater looks like with their junior um, actors group we're going to hopefully have some poetry reading we're going to have a kids band from Austin coming in to play. Uh, a lot of community partners will have tables set up with information about different things that parents can have access to to help make a successful school year. And we're going to be also highlighting the services the library offers. So story times, crafts, and we're going to have the uh, something new is the Bow Wow Book Club. They're bringing in some dogs from the Dorothy O'Connor Pet Adoption Center. And they are non-judgmental listeners for kids who like to <laughs> read to the dogs. They'll have an opportunity to try that out. So just a lot of fun things we're doing on August the 13th. That's the afternoon uh, from 1 to 4. So, so really excited about that one. Okay, moving back to budget. So for this upcoming year, our proposed budget is fairly flat and our requests kept to a minimum. So there's no new major projects or initiatives included in this budget. It is a maintenance budget. And as can be seen on this chart, our largest increase is in personnel. That's the $30,066, which is less than a 1% increase. Our second largest increase is in capital, and there is a decrease in maintenance and operation budget requests. The increases in the personnel budget reflects the city's proposed pay program only, and there's no change in the number of employees, so we're not adding any new positions. 
decreases in maintenance and operations are attributed to several things. Um, small things or things that we've worked on to kind of uh, make more efficient. Decrease in postage because we use more uh, electronic verification methods for um, reaching out to our users. Decreases in some printer maintenance costs. Decrease in light and power line item based on previous year's use. This next slide just gives a little bit more detail on the variances. The 3% <coughs> pay program would increase this line item by $30,066, as I mentioned. In the maintenance and operations line, we have decreases in office supplies, office equipment maintenance, and our library subscriptions, and light and power. And we have an increase in that electronic subscriptions line. What we've done is we've made some transfers between library subscriptions and electronic. Library subscriptions is your print line. Electronic is your e-format. Uh, when I talk about e-books and e-audio books. Um, and we have also had some slight vendor increases with e-audio books and e-books. Capital spending is listed here as well. The capital requests include one-time expenses for replacement of one HVAC unit at the library, some interior painting, <coughs> Replacement of a public copier and updates to the library's wireless network. So that's what's listed under capital. Going back to your uh, maintenance and operation, uh, the electronic versus the print, you know, y'all probably, some of you remember over the last few years, are constantly evaluating where that money needs to be and whether print or electronic. Uh, so in that, again, Dana continues to do that every year to make that determination. And it is an area that's changing, so we have to be kind of flexible in the, between those two lines. Finally, um, looking to the future. So out of necessity, a flat budget has been presented, but I still feel that there are many projects and upcoming improvements that need to be kept in mind as we look towards the next three to five years. The library remains a highly used city service, and we are one of the busiest places downtown. But flat budgets and continual deferment of additional investment in the library and its services does not allow us to keep pace with the continued high use of our physical building, <coughs> the increased growth and need for digital literacy and electronic resources in our community. To use our physical space to its maximum capacity and we need to consider options for increasing our reach into the community further. So some of the projects which have been put on the back burner and continue to be an area of concern that we need to keep out there in front of us include development of a library pavilion. And this would be on the main street side of the building, that west side of our building. This would allow us to more fully use the existing building and the property, so what we already have on that site, increase our, our our square foot footage of use there per patron. We also need to be thinking about the replacement of our carpeting. It's a necessary expense with 4,000 people coming in and out of the building daily, and that carpeting was installed in 2007. So we're getting close to the 10 year um, on that. Installing an elevator to our upstairs workspace. We currently have a dumbwaiter, which allows us to take a lot of the heavy boxes that need to be taken upstairs on that dumbwaiter. But really looking at um, elevator space that allows us to make that space ADA compliant and improve staff, staff access, because we do have offices on the second floor. And then looking into establishment of mobile services or additional satellite building to expand our reach in the community making our services more accessible for all. In addition to all this, I also see opportunities in the future with funding for the library to develop maker spaces, which encompass opportunities for people with similar interests to come together to learn more about technology, arts, crafts, innovation. And I think that the library is a perfect place to introduce 3D printing technology and provide this service to those for whom it is unavailable or inaccessible. So that is the overview of the budget for Victoria Public Library. And I am more than happy to answer any questions now or during the budget process as we move through it. Nice thing about us meeting for four nights in a row. You know, if, if something pops up tomorrow night, you have a, 
comment or question about the library, she will be here to answer questions. So it's not like if you don't have, if you have something now, ask, but it's not like this is your only chance. <laughs> Yes. On the pavilion, that's interesting, and you know, it's, I know that's just an artist's conception, but with you might remember that RFID technology, you co-mingle with the security there. You wouldn't need such a big, expensive wall around it. That's right. Think about that. You could you might have a much less, a you know, more visually appealing barrier if if y'all can figure out how to make it part of your RFID fence. Yes. So just just thinking out loud, the. Uh, and I didn't hear you. I was over here using my calculator. That decrease in light and power of eleven thousand dollars. What did we attribute that to? Just no, we can't explain that. That's pretty significant. I thought. Well, I just basically ran into weather. Oh, okay. okay. Last year we came in under. Didn't need to use AC. Uh, much. and this year we had a, as you can tell, the type of weather we're having now. We're going to hit close to next year's, last year's uh, cost too. So. So you just decreased. I budgeted the, the same levels last year, so that's the cost of the decrease. I was hoping you would tell me it's some of the infrastructure changes or but well we did place a AC unit so some buildings we did some yeah. of that stuff with lighting I thought oh, but uh, mainly it's because uh, it's a trend okay. and the weather condition very good and we did have the update on the lighting so we have those lights that when they're not in use in certain spaces they will turn off because of motion sensor that's really helped um, we have the thermostats that of course um, building services controls those for us the timing on those and and just watching you know the levels of um, how cold and how hot it is so that's made it a lot nicer too to have that computer access to the thermostats too helps a lot okay I'm sure that's all reflected in that mm -hmm. in a small way very good council okay just to, uh, thank you, Dana. Just a comment. You'll probably hear some of these other future needs. Uh, you know, all all the departments have a nice wish list, and they're all very worthy projects. But my job at the end of the day is to try to make to balance a budget, and try to decide which departmental you know is a priority for the year. So what Dana presents and what she said, it doesn't mean it's not a priority, but it's just when you try to make it fit into a nice little uh, you know framework for a balanced budget sometimes we cannot fund things so um yeah her pavilion idea is a great idea and it's we've talked about it for two years now and i'm sure we're going to continue talking about it so <laughs> but you'll hear that from other department heads when they talk about future needs what they're needing thank you thank you dana so um oh it's colby i was going to pass it to jared but i'm glad you got of it yeah <laughs> I don't want you've you had to a, get the money before I do. You've had a fun week. It's been interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have to tell real quick. Colby sent me a picture, uh, a text message with a picture of the park. Was that on Saturday or su Sunday, Saturday, mate? Yeah, Sunday. Sunday right and, you know, Colby and his staff have worked diligently over the last two years to bring Riverside Park up to the level it is today and to make it look nice. And so I sent it back and said, are you okay? Because <laughs> I know it's disheartening, but his attitude was positive. He said, we'll just get back in there and start cleaning up again. We'll get, so. it, we'll get it going. It'll be all right. It's going to be all right. Yeah. Mayor, council members, thank you. Uh, this is the 2015-16 uh, proposed budget for uh, Parks and Recreation. At any time through this presentation, if you've got any questions or, or anything at all, just let me know, and I'll stop and we'll talk about it. Um, We've got 46 employees uh, spread out through Parks and Recreation. Six of those are with the, the community center. Um, we've got parks mowing and maintenance, 21. Uh, what we call flood buyout is one. Uh, right of way mowing is five. Recreation programming is two. Athletic fields is eight. And uh, the administration is three. One thing that we did, and I talked about this at my presentation last year that I was working on, and that what you would see this year is is we started park maintenance standards. Uh, this is something that we do internally in our in our department. Uh, uh, quarterly, we go through and we grade our parks, and and so that helps me develop um, what are our strengths of our park system, what are our weaknesses, um, and and we do that whether it's uh, sometimes we have our crew leader, sometimes we'll have recreation go out. Uh, I vary that on on who goes out and judges that, so that that a fresh set of eyes looking at the park. Um, this is the standards that we've come up with right now. Uh, this will will change, you know, over the course of the year, but it it helps me develop, like I said, those strengths and weaknesses. Uh, it, it helps me look at the entire park system, not just really focused on one area or not, and, and where we're ranking, what we're doing. Uh, our target goal is 85%. And so 
by getting that target goal and setting these standards, now I'm able to start working on my budgets of how these, uh, where I'm going with proposed projects. And, and, and in the future, you'll continue to see this come through and, and see when I'm starting to present projects of where it's hitting on those lines as, you know, this year we may be focused more on Riverside. When Riverside starts to get to that higher level, we'll, we'll move over to the other parks. Does that make sense? It's like the street rating program in exactly. a way. Exactly. Tell, tell us what you're looking for when you're doing those. We're looking at, at, at you know, are our picnic tables looking good? Is there any graffiti on those picnic tables? Are our fence lines, you know, correct? Are they not bent, bent up? Are, um, you know, are, is our fall zones right? Or is the mowing uh, done correctly? You know, and so just a different, uh, a bunch of different questions. There's probably 60 to 70 questions on each park uh, and, and the amenities in the, in the parks that we go through and grade just as, as a quick yes or no. Uh, type thing and they're not our staff doesn't know when these are coming and we put them on them and and go out there to see it so it's been a very good tool that we've used so far so just your employees do the grading yes sir yes sir. how often quarterly 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 yeah in our park system uh, right now on the the parkland mowing we've got 631 plus acres that is it's 546 and a half man hours per cycle, and we get roughly 20 to 22 of those per year, depending on what the weather's like. Uh, miscellaneous <coughs> non-park mowing, uh, that would be the library, some of our other, other facilities that we take care of, uh, just over seven acres, and it's 90 hours, and we as well get 20 to 22 cycles on there. Our right-of-way mowing, this number was really shocking to me, is 521 miles or acres of, of right-of-way mowing. That's a lot. Um, and it takes, it's 380 man hours per cycle. Uh, with those, we do get 10 to 12 per year. Uh, well, sir? I got to put you on the spot. Why was it shocking? It's just you, your former. No, you just don't, you don't think about it that much. You don't think about it. You know, you've got three or four guys that go out and you're really not, you're not, you're not focused on it until you start driving the loop and you start, it's just, it's, it's really a lot of different areas that you would not take into account that parks does. You know, uh, that's, those are non-park mowing facilities that is that we don't, that, you know, you wouldn't consider parks and recreation. And so that's where it's really shocking. Yeah, Sorry. they're not recreational that's areas. That's right. They're just that's, right away. So. That's right. Okay. That's right. Years ago, the street department was responsible for that. And I'll, I'll took it over. It to Lynn, and Colby's, <laughs> for the last two years, has been trying to give it back. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've proven yourself in your department is good at being mowers you know, you are don't tell him that so. <laughs> sorry <laughs> Lynn came mow he can build streets but no, I'm sorry that's all right well it's Kobe says he'll give him the equipment I'll give him the equipment, the equipment. That's that's equipment. no problem I, I have a question on that too yes because you said right away and then you talked about um, the, the loop but is, is this also the the rights of way the little strips outside of all of the subdivisions uh, some of them just some depends them. on what the base is like you you'll you'll have a a real quick example is um i guess it's been wilson that runs between um east and uh bell tower area right there it depends on how wide it is uh we go a certain amount and then the homeowners will take it to a certain amount and that was done historically by my predecessor as far as how big those areas were um and so we it's it's really a scattered list um, I, I'd, I'd have to bring it to you one time to show you. It's just it, some of them. It's just because it's the way it's been done. Is that we want, and we're looking into those to find out. Okay, what is the case, and why are we doing those? Or, and you know, do those need to go back to the homeowner and stuff? We're working real well with code enforcement on those issues like that. Because yeah, homeowners actually supposed to take care of to the back of the curb. Yes. And so uh, there's some cases where you know with fences, uh, where. It's difficult for homeowners to get to so we've done some of that but we really want the homeowners to take care of their property um, most of the stuff now if it's not our routine maintenance the, the co code enforcement's done a great job as far as taking that back on and not just pushing it over to the parks they they've really uh, worked hard to to get that either to the homeowner or to a, a private contractor We're, that's we've been relieved of that in the last year and a half and so I, I want to be clear. I'm not talking about that area between the edge of the yard and, and the street in the residential area. Right. Uh, just so that everybody's clear oh, that okay. that's sure. not what I'm talking right, about at right. all. I'm talking about the uh, area between the edge of the subdivision and the street, for instance, up and down John Stockbauer or across Ben Jordan, those strips that are outside of those various <laughs> subdivisions that are three feet to six feet wide. On thoroughfares. On thoroughfares. On thoroughfares. We'll, we'll hand them. Okay. Yes. Some. Not Some all. Of them. Yes. Some not all. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And but that's still a learning so process with me, exactly just, which one those are. Okay. So, yeah. so everybody else is clear that, no, you know, okay. I'm not talking about 
in front. I don't want you mowing in front of my house. That's not what I'm asking. <laughs> Gonna leave big ruts. <laughs> Uh, one of the other things that we have introduced and really started to increase is our herbicide spraying. Uh, we do uh, 74 miles herbicide spraying. Uh, that is uh, uh, gutters, that's uh, um, uh, curb and gutter areas that, that we do spray. And so uh, we have uh, specifically put two staff members on that that go out. And so we really tried to increase that and make that a routine uh, every nine weeks, that every nine weeks we are going north, south, east, and west on our major thoroughfares to make those look better and, and not to have those high weeds. Now that's hurt us this last you know few months, but um, uh, that is uh, what it's taken us to do it, and we're really putting a more focus on that type of uh, program. Another thing in the recreation programs, this is is very similar to the um, uh, park maintenance. Uh, we're looking at every event that we do and, and looking at what is the cost participant per participant uh, that, we're, that, we're, that we're using. So we're making sure that we're spending our money wisely and, and, best, and, and reevaluating every program and, and, and not just saying this is a program that we've done for 15 years, we've got to continue to do it. We're looking at what are our costs. Uh, that the recreation part of that budget is very small, and so we want to get the most bang for the buck out of that is. And so this is a relatively new program that we started, and so I would imagine as the next year or so come up, you'll start to see these numbers move, and we may be moving programs around that we, we you know, aren't becoming cost effective to us to do. I'm going to ask the question, why is flag football at $15 compared to softball or kickball? Flag football is, is, a, is a new program that we just started. It's in its second season um, of that, and so we're trying to build our team base um, on there. And so that's what we are looking at on, on what is that cost and what, if you'll remember in the, uh, the fee structures that we just did where, we allowed you, where you allowed me to be able to set those fees, that's what this will help manage is it gives that ability for us to look at, okay, is this a program that we want to do and how much do we need to charge to be able to do it uh, effectively where before it was three hundred dollars and that way I can go back in now and uh, staff can internally look at and say this program's not effective for us but do we still want to have it okay if we do we need to get that number back down to an acceptable level and then I can adjust the rate if need be what's an acceptable level That would be a question that is, do you view this as a service to the community? Do you view this as a program that is, is uh, you know, something that's needed? Uh, you know, you could, you could go in and say, okay, our uh, movies in the park are one of our better rated. We need to have more of those, but we don't, okay, let's don't do softball. Now you're affecting a group of people that are playing softball. So we just got to make sure that we're not getting those out of balance in a sense like the flag football is. Yeah, I'm just looking at athletics things, and it's double the, what normally the others are. So That's true. And it's something internal we, we are looking no, at. I, I know it's been addressed. Thank you. Sure. As far as this year's presented budget, uh, in the blue is 2015, in the red is 2016. Uh, on personnel, we are up $38,000. <clears> that is contributed to the pay program. Uh, we are also implementing um, in the department a, a step type of program where we're able to go from a maintenance level one to a maintenance level three and very specific steps to be able to get there. Uh, previously, before this program, uh, somebody that came into the parks department would not be able to move up when they learn better skills. They're still at that entry level position. We didn't have anywhere them, for them to go unless they transferred to another department uh, or we had somebody that retired. Uh, our higher end jobs that we have, we don't, we're not losing those very often. We're wanting to give our new employees and our lower end employees the ability to gain skills and with that not lose them, keep them in our department and, and give them raises when, they're, when they meet certain criteria. For this program, we've, we've, this year we've uh, put half of that in into this year's budget. What I, we went through, Gilbert and I went through, and we, we classified each employee and where we thought they could be in this next year and went to that raise. And then next year, if they were level one, we're not, we didn't budget for them to jump up to a level three automatically. We budgeted them as a level two, and then next year we'll bring them in as a level three. That does not mean they will get that raise, but it gives us the opportunity, if they do meet that criteria, then we can give them uh, the pay to justify what they've learned and what they've done. Does that make sense? Is that in addition to the regular 3%? Yes. Okay. It's, it's 
Okay. It's kind of like a promotional type deal based on skills base. If they reach certain, mm -hmm. we call it a career ladder. Okay. You know, they've got to achieve certain skills. But they will get the basic 3%. Okay. Yes. Just in case okay. they don't. Because some people are happy right where they're at. But for those employees that have that desire to learn more mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, then it's a way for them to do that. And like Colby said, hopefully retain them. Yes. Um, okay. So that's our goal. Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, our operating budget has gone down uh, $172,000. A lot of that is contributed to uh, uh, one-time money that we had in, in that area. Uh, with the, uh, For an example of that would be the, the money that was uh, for the convention center drawings. Uh, was in there that's not being requested in there and so that's where the, most of that stuff in there there are some operational costs that, that we saw savings in but but very flat for the most part most of that is, is one-time money uh, the capital you see a big increase there that is for the building uh, our finance director wanted to make sure that we stuck that in our in the budget so that it was very visible of where that was going to be and and not you know get st get into a backside of a, a, a street program or something of that nature so it's very visible where that that money is going to be coming from that building is still in dry land? It's what? It's still in dry land? Where we proposed putting the building, yes. Well, okay. even Colby's old building is still dry. It's high yes. enough. Uh, but, yes, it will be. And we be. can get to it? Oh, okay. absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Was that the building in the picture that we saw earlier? Uh, that was I think that was Riverside Convention No, that was Convention Center. Center. Oh, okay. Yes, that was a Convention okay. Center. He didn't want to move in there. <laughs> These are the major projects that we're uh, proposing this year. You've got Grover's Bend Playground. We'll replace that playground. We will demo the pool. We'll add a nine-hole disc golf course to the Fox Bend area. Uh, do some replacement at the duck pond as far as the sidewalks. We're going to partnership with Challenge Athletes to create an uh, all-inclusive playground. Uh, they are looking at matching that, so it would be a $300,000 playground at um, um, at Riverside Park and so that um, we feel like that's a very good uh, tool it's it's going to be a program you would not notice anything different but it's going to be available for for all kids to be at not you know all of our playgrounds are ADA accessible but that doesn't mean that, that they're easy to be played along by everyone and so that's what this inclusive playground will be of course you have the parks building and then uh, Riverside Park restrooms remodel. We'll, we will gut both restrooms at uh, Restroom 1 and Riverside at uh, Grover's Bend and replace them with all new uh, structures, go through there and sandblast the, the walls and repaint everything there. Um, anything up, up top that needs to replace as far as electrical lighting, uh, we'll go in and replace everything. And so we'll just we'll keep the shell of it and replace everything inside of it. I thought you couldn't demo them because of there been a flood way or something. You can, but there's steps that you have to go through to, to do that, and we've just felt this was an easier way for us to, you know, the, the, the cinder block walls are fine, uh, and so just being able to go through there and sand, sandblast them, replace the, the structure in them, I think will help out a lot. And the dog park's still a work in progress. I know there's a lot dog of park is there. A fundraising going on there, yes, so that's not it's too early for all that. Okay. I did want to point out that these projects may change depending on what damage we have from the river. Uh, you know, depending on what, what happens there after, after the waters go down and we're able to assess that, we may have to move some of the money around on these to, to take care of our current facilities that we have uh, if it's a large item that can't be done within this year's budget money. Make sense? Our community center budget, uh, it's, it's relatively flat as well. You have a small increase in personnel. M&O is, is a small decrease. The capital on there is a large increase, but I'm going to go into that next. Uh, that is going to be, we're going to read, we're proposing to, to finish out the community center remodel. Uh, as many of you know, we did the, the annex. We did some of the dome kitchen. Uh, we did some painting on the outside. We're looking at finishing this facility. That would be the lobby, the dome re, uh, do, redo the annex um, kitchen area. Um, put some fans in the arena, uh, the uh, replace the acoustical panels, um, and then do some work outside and landscaping and, and uh, to the portico. Colby, do you know if y'all are, I know it's not in this budget because I don't see it, to put a floor down in the, in the arena? 
Did we put a floor down in the arena? Uh huh. I, apparently, there was a study done by when Gabe was on the council, and he asked if we could look into that because we had y'all had talked about it then. It was part of this study. At the time, council wasn't interested in. Um, remodeling that to do a floor but you're talking about so it could be used for like exhibits and all and not yes, just the dirt uh -huh. so, um, and get that's, more use uh, you know and, and get more use out of the community <clears throat> center that's not in this projected budget i could i can find out what a, an estimated cost of what that would be and bring that back if you'd like me to uh, councilwoman um, the the gist of the study <coughs> said it would be cheaper to tear that structure down and build new than it would be to go in, add flooring, and the insulation, and the air conditioning, electrical, and the whole nine yards. Kind of like the Riverside Convention Center thing. Yeah, but he was just talking about the floor, not not enclosing it. I guess that's true. Yeah. Just take yeah, the just dirt out. In a limited out. fashion, yeah. that might work. Mm -hmm. And then if we have a rodeo or, or something, we'd have to bring dirt in for those events. Right, right. You're not talking to me. You're just talking replace the the dirt flooring with maybe a concrete surface. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can yes. I can figure out that number. Yeah, something like that. So that way you could use that for exhibits later. Mm -hmm. I, I, Kobe, how do you feel about the parking? It seems like sometimes that facility is overflowing with cars. And is there any thought about additional parking in that green space, or is that even possible? Or do we need parking at this well, point? That's the if do we need it? I know we've talked before. There should be adequate par parking to accommodate multiple events going on. So um, it's designed that way. But we've not looked at at it's. You well, can do. You can take some green space and make more par parking. If well, I've seen to, in my experiences so, yeah. going out there, a lot of people parking in the green area. Okay. Yeah. Port Stroman, the overflow, uh -huh. which leads me to believe. Well, we're not utilizing either the back part of the parking lot. Or behind the building mm -hmm. or we're at capacity at times with sure. parking which may also I know we've got capacity issues in the building mm -hmm. where we've hit maximum people capacity yes, sir. so it may not even behoove us to put more parking if we can't put more people in the mm -hmm. building so I don't know how that how that jives but I have seen a lot of cars park in that green space we, we have added Mr. Alvarez we have added in our uh, the ability for if you wanted to rent the dome and you didn't want another facility, another of the other two areas to be rented, that you could rent that and that way you wouldn't have multiple events going on. Uh, that is uh, something that has been brought up and we've been able to do that uh, so it can stop that for having, the, when we get in trouble for those parts when we had three events going on at the same time. Uh, that's when that parking lot gets so big that you, you you can't park there. So we've we've had that ability. Now you don't have to take that, you know, that option, but there is that, uh, that option available to, to customers well I just to look at additional parking if that's feasible or not okay sure and that is my presentation unless there's questions thank you very much thank you uh, Gilbert Colby needs some money in his office supplies for toner <laughs> Colby, so well, is that <laughs> trying to save money there? So he's, he's oh okay. He's got enough. For, you got toner money. So. Oh, I wondered why it was kind of light. I said, okay, are we going lighter? Gilbert's probably cut him out on his office supply budget. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jared. Nickel, please, development nickel, services. Do what? Need a nickel, please. <laughs> All right. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, I'd like to uh, also take this opportunity to introduce uh, my assistant director. I think several of y'all have met her, but if you haven't, uh, I have Julie Fulgham uh, with us. She's been with us since October, last October. So anyway, um, so we'll have get her into stand it. up so everybody up here can see her. She hides behind Lynn. Thank you, Julie. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll get into it. Um, the Development Services Department is made up of 26 employees divided into four divisions. Uh, some of y'all have seen something similar to this last year. Uh, we have seven employees in what we call the Planning Services Division that uh, takes care of Planning Commission, administers the CDBG and MPO uh, grants. The Development Center, which is our permitting 
Uh, building inspection function uh, has 10 employees. There are five in cut enforcement and four in the GIS mapping division. Give you a snapshot of the activity that's um, been going on over the last uh, three years. Uh, man, those slides are hard to read up there. Um, good thing you have it in front of you. As you can see, the uh, cut enforcement uh, cases, we uh, fairly consistent activity of averaging around 3,300 to 3,400 cases um, that they're managing a year. Um, the next few line items, you can start. You can see the buildup of the development activity that we've been talking about over the last few years. Uh, building inspections uh, from a little over 7,000 in 2012 to over 10,000 this past fiscal year. Um, new homes permitted, um, 155 last year. We're holding steady uh, with this first six months, around 12 to 13 a month uh, in that activity. Platted over 500 lots last year. Um, and did $168 million in permanent activity last year. So I think that was our peak. We're seeing that uh, certainly, uh, I don't, don't want to say activity slowed down, but the, the, those high permit values of, of multi-million dollar apartment complexes have not occurred in the last six months. So um, I think we're around 50, 52, 55 million uh, for this current fiscal year, just to kind of give you an idea of where we at or are at. Moving on into the budget, um, see uh, where we were in 2015 and where we're proposing to be in 2016, uh, or relatively, um, as others have mentioned, the maintenance budget. Uh, personnel, uh, slight increase of $43,050, which is uh, attributable uh, for the most part to the across the proposed across the board raise. Um, our maintenance and operation is down except for some planned one-time expenses that I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, capital items uh, are also down about $15,000. And you can see for an overall difference uh, when you take into account the one-time expenses of about an $81,000 increase over last year. A couple of slides here that sort of break that down. Uh, personnel, there's a little bit of a carryover for the 3% uh, pay for performance. Uh, that was in this year's budget. As I mentioned, the 3% across the board, and then some adjustments uh, for some personnel changes that have happened over the last 12 months for an overall increase in personnel of 43,050. <coughs> On the M&O, um, we're expecting, we have an increase in uh, our software, software maintenance for the new Intergov software, which will uh, hopefully still come online in late November, early December. Uh, proposing two vehicle replacements, two trucks for our building inspectors, little increase in our mileage reimbursement, um, increase in bank merchant charges for the credit card processing. We have a decrease in contract labor uh, overall for the department, and that's attributable, attributable to our sale of Swan Crossing lots. Uh, that's starting to finally that, that maintenance cost of that subdivision is coming down. Uh, and we're also uh, decreasing the uh, contract uh, amount that uh, code enforcement uses to do abatement on private property. Uh, we haven't been spending as much of the money that's been budgeted in that account. And there's also a proposed uh, decrease in demolition of $10,000, uh, again, because we haven't been spending all of the money that it's budgeted. As you can see, that's an overall increase of 55643 Capital is a decrease. Uh, we had uh, copiers and computers last year, and there are fewer, those, fewer of those this year, uh, giving you a, a decrease of 15,100. <coughs> and then kind of a summary of the one time or the variances. Uh, so recall this uh, current year, we've had the comprehensive plan update and the quiet zone study, which I understand John is gonna be giving you a presentation on that uh, later this month. Uh, those two were 195,000 together, and then we have 90, 97,200 in one-time expenses planned for 2016. Uh, that would be for a new uh, set of aerial photography that we would uh, partner with the appraisal district for, and some additional uh, planometrics. Excuse me, that would um, planometrics for those nifty lines you see on GIS that pick up sidewalks and utility poles and driveway cuts. Those, those are the line items we're 
the items we're hoping to pick up off the new aerial photography to help out public works uh, and designing some of their projects. Um, and then also a small increase, small amount of money uh, to continue the comprehensive plan uh, that will help us with our public involvement, printing, and just uh, some supplies for that. Um, <clears throat> so that is kind of my budget in a nutshell. Any questions? Yes, sir. What's the status of the um, quiet zone study? John's presenting it on the 16th. This John on the 16th. <laughs> it was put in my budget, but it was a senior manager project. So. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know the total cost of that uh, flyover aerial photography for that contract? I know Our, Mr. Alvarez is on that board. He may know, but... The city's portion is uh, 65000 <clears throat> So, oh, okay. You don't happen to recall. I don't know what the whole cost, overall. What our percent is relative to the other taxing yes, authorities. You don't. I, can't recall. It's I don't know. The, all the taxing authorities don't participate in it. Uh, I don't this believe. Is, this this sixty five thousand dollars buys us um, higher resolution for uh, the city limits and portions of the ETJ. Uh, it's well, not like a pro rata share of the overall cost. We could choose. They do indirectly. But well, I got you. I but we okay, ask, we ask for this addition. We ask for additional uh, resolution that lets you lets us really be able to get down as you as you zoom into the images to to do our work. Because so. we've done it before. Yes, sir. This is not the first time. Yeah, we did okay. this uh, in 2013. Okay. And it's not every year, but because I hadn't seen. It I think last he's year. trying to do it every three years. They're trying here. to yes. The appraisal district had been, I believe, on a kind of a five-year rotation. They've moved that to a three-year, and certainly with the, the significant development activity we've happened, we've been having uh, every th the three-year rotation is uh, is necessary. Okay. It's a call saver for us, though, versus us going out and doing it on our own. Right. So. Yeah. Well, the details are pretty good too. Yes, it's very good. We don't have Wish they'd give us warning there. about it. <laughs> I don't want to be sunbathing or. <laughs> the resolution's not quite that good. <laughs> they will not tell you. Now, Mr. Alvarez, they won't tell you when they do it. It's because I've asked. So. I know. Won't well, they secret. they also do it in in late February, early March when the leaves are off of the. Well, it's a little yes. cooler. So you're probably not out sunbathing during that time. Okay. But never know. Right. Any other questions? Thank you, Jared. Pretty serious bunch here tonight. <laughs> I would say that we could go f keep going. That Just one's for, not mine. Let me, let me do a <laughs> clarification real quick. Uh, Jan's asking, so somebody doesn't wonder what she's asking me about. We, we refer to the fiscal year 15, 16 as 16. I know, you know, so the year, the budget year we're in right now is actually 14, 15. Well, we always call it 15. And so what we're doing is what starts October 1, which is actually 15 through 16. Does that make sense? I'm just not clear on why there, okay. are, why there are variances, one for fiscal year 15 and one for fiscal year 16. It kind of seems like one of them would not be involved right now. Or, and I didn't know whether it was calendar year nah. 15 or... Uh, What's the difference between this budget and next budget? The oh, he's just showing one-time variance. One-time variances. Is all one-time expenses. On the, the only main reason they do that is to show you the reoccurring operation. You want to take those out so you can see what's really happening from year to year on a reoccurring program basis. It's so really not a variance, though, really and truly. It's what his one-time expense was in 15 and then what his one-time expense was in 16. It, yeah, it's really... It's a re yeah, it's, reminder. It's a, yeah, it's really not a variance. Okay, they're not both in there. No, that's right. Thank you. Yeah. Makes sense. Uh, so Daryl's standing up before you, and we we talked today about we should he's going to change his lead off. But go ahead. Darryl. You can go with the good now news. Now I'll let you do the lead off. <laughs> the good news is there's no rate increase this year on garbage services. We're not recommending one. Now, not recommending one. Now, if you decide you want to do one, we're. <laughs> That's right. Council can always override. We need some more money for parks. Oh. <laughs> Chances of a decrease? No. Uh, no. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that was a quick answer. We start talking like that, I'm done. 
<laughs> so I'm here tonight to talk about the uh, environmental services budget, um, which really includes uh, solid waste, yard waste, the tree limb collection, recyclable material collection, that's the every other week uh, curbside, household hazardous waste, our air quality and water quality um, education and activities that we do. Just kind of a little bit of uh, history, looking at May 1st, 2013 through April 30th, 2014. And then the same period, uh, May 1st, 2014 to May for, or to April 30th, 2015. You can see um, on garbage, we went from 19 point, or 19,140 tons to 20,992 tons, the increase of about 1,800 tons. Um, yard waste, we actually went down. Uh, we went down about 90 tons on yard waste. Now, I want to caution you, because we've had all this rain, a lot of weekends, which is when most of the yard waste, get, yard waste gets accumulated, has been rainy weekends. Um, so I look for that to change, but the other issue this year that we're going to have is because it's rained so far into the year, we're going to have yard waste. Usually by end of June, we're picking up very little. I don't think that's going to happen this year. I think we're going to see it accumulate just a little later in the year. Recycle materials, still up, still averaging about 70%. Um, we went from 31.35 to 34.57, about 322 tons more than we did last year. Uh, household hazardous waste, we dropped off a little bit, about three tons from 59 to 56. Um, Charmel had asked me just kind of how many people use that. On average, about 90 to 93 households a month that give us stuff. Now, we saw a huge uh, amount of that at first. If you'll remember, when we first started this, I mean, we were doing 100, 150 homes a month. Once we got rid of all those old TVs and we got rid of all those old computers, it's kind of slowed down. What we see now in the reports I get is, is we're still kind of high on the computers and TVs, but we're getting a lot more of the paint, a lot more of the old pesticides, herbicides, things like that. So it is still a vital part of our program that gets used on a regular basis. And then residential garbage accounts, uh, 19,474 last year. This year we're up to 19,610, so an increase of about 136 customers. Um, you'll see Jared's number is a little different than mine, but you got to remember when people move out, I get vacant houses. My number changes month to month, depending on move-ins, move-outs, that's rentals, uh, whatever. So my number always will be a little different than his. This is what we actually bill on the UBO bill each each month. Gerald. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so when you're, you have somebody that moves out and comes back in and they start again, do you count them as a new customer then? I, I count them as a garbage service. I uh -huh. don't count them as a new customer. I just look strictly at garbage services. Okay. So my number, if somebody moves out, it'll drop from 19610 to 19605 one month, and the next month it might be 19640. It just comes and goes. Okay, I see what you mean. This is our proposed budget for uh, this year. And personnel, you'll see that we've actually gone down about 24,569, um, and I'll explain that in a future slide. Uh, our M and O is actually up uh, a million four. Our capital is up about 23,000. Our total budget is up about 1.436 million dollars. Here's kind of what we've done. On the personnel side, we're down about 24, 569. Um, it, the biggest part of that is reduction in overtime. Um, between some things that we've done in the past, some things that we're going to do in the future that I'll get to in just a minute, um, even though we're adding a route, we're still going to be able to cut down our personnel cost. Maintenance and operation, here's the big number. Uh, 1.485 million dollars to purchase five automated trucks, four replacements. I've got trucks now, automated trucks that are seven years old. Uh, two years ago, we put arms on those to get some more time out of them. Those first seven trucks that we've got are at the point they need to be replaced. They spend more time down than they do on the street. Uh, a lot of you have seen us picking up uh, the gray containers with rear loaders. That's because I'm having trouble keeping those trucks up. 
And then our capital is up about 23.4. Um, we're going to dim, uh, our plan is to uh, tear down the old building at Pine Street that used, that served as a recycle center for a while. Um, it's become a place of contention over the last several years with uh, people coming down the railroad tracks, going in there, breaking in, smashing windows, lighting fires, all different kinds of things. So in our opinion, it'd just be good to get rid of it. And then uh, some new carpet in our offices over at 700 Main Street, the environmental offices. Um, here's the uh, no rate increase slide, uh, just to make sure that we get it out to the public. Um, that's your current rates that you're paying now, the rates you'll be paying for next year, and all zeros down the increase side. Here's the uh, proposed route changes I mentioned earlier that's helping us save the money. Currently, we run five automated routes four days a week. Um, due to the increase of customers that we've had over the seven, last seven years, plus the extra carts that we've got out on the street, we need to increase that. Um, we've got guys working until 9 o'clock at night sometimes. Part of that's because of the older trucks, but part of it's also just because we've, we started these routes out at eight and 900 homes a route per day, and we're now picking up 12 and 1,300 a day. We've got to get that back to a manageable number. Um, and so what our what we propose is that we go to six routes four days a week. What we're going to do, if you'll look at the next line, the semi-automated that we currently do that picks up the dead ends in town, uh, they do some regular garbage, but they start out, they work half a day picking up dead ends, they work the other half of the day picking up yard waste. What we're going to do is we're going to take those two individuals, one of them will go to a full-time recycle route, one of them will go to a full-time automated route. And that will give us two full-time recycle guys, two full, uh, that extra automated guy all week, and do away uh, next year. We will not have any more rear loaders picking up trash. And then what we will do is take those two and a half routes that we had working four days a week on yard waste, move them to two routes, take those half-day routes, and we'll have a fifth day. So we'll be picking up yard waste five days a week next year. Um, Future items, and, and I clicked to this kind of quick, but I wanted to get to it because of the route changes. We don't expect to start this if approved by council until at least January, but probably February. One, I won't see those new trucks until January if I'm lucky. It may be later than that. But we want to do a really good job getting out to the public. And, and we're moving, with these route changes, we are going to have to move some people, but we're moving the smallest amount of people that we have to. Um, we went through, we have spent months. Um, this software that we purchased a few years ago, that routing software, is what has allowed us to do this. And we can pick out areas of the city, pick out the smallest groups of people to move. And we will be doing a very in-depth, uh, a lot of personal visits to make sure that a month ahead of time, we get these people on their new schedule so that they understand and it's not just boom, you know, we're throwing the switch on this. Uh, it's important that they know well ahead of time where we're, when they're going to get picked up and when their days are changed. Not everybody's going to get changed. Probably, I think we figured out it was less than 1% are going to end up with the actual change. So, uh, also a future item, uh, we've got to continue to monitor carts. We've got carts that have been out there now seven years almost seven and a half years. Um, we're starting to see them come in with the broken wheels. We're starting to see them come in with the broken lids, different things like that. Some of it is uh, abuse. Um, you know, we're picking them up, setting them down. Uh, you get a truck that gets off sometimes, it'll set them down hard, but a lot of it's just age. A lot of it's just age. We can't expect these carts to last forever. If we get 10 years out of most of them, we're good, but we're already at seven. We're starting to see those come in, so we're gonna have to start looking at replacing those some type of a schedule and city managers talk to me about you know let's kind of put a schedule together and let's not try and hit them all at once um, we'll look at having to replace the other three side load trucks that were bought originally uh, we think we can push that out with the new trucks to 17 18 time frame and then we'll we'll have in 2025 about 28.2 acres to close at the landfill um, We've got that listed right now. 
that may go back farther. It may come sooner. Um, we've kind of coincided that with uh, kind of the end of Republic's contract and different things like that because they'll be responsible for a portion as well. Um, and with that, I'll take any questions. I have a question. Yes, uh, ma'am. And it, somebody asked me this. I was at a school function, and they said to ask if the carts, when we replace them again, is it the heaviest uh, lid that you can get? Because he said sometimes, you know, he gets tickets because the lid opens, and sometimes it's just the wind. It's not necessarily that he's overfilled his cart. And I don't know what you could do about that, but. There are a couple things you can do. One option is kind of off the table for us, and that's they actually make a lid that has a cord on the front that hooks into a hole in the lid. Of course, then you do away with your automated service because right. we'd have to get out and open them. The other thing that we do is we coach our drivers. I mean, if we've got a day where the wind's blowing, especially like we've had the last couple of weeks, um, if they drive by and the lid's open, and the whole streets, the lids open. Unless there's something sticking way up out of the top, we should be going ahead and servicing the cart. So I would ask him to, or ask customers to, if we've got a windy day and we left your cart and you're tagged and there's four or five people around you that's tagged, we need to know about it. Okay. Call our office and, and, and we'll take care of it. Is there any position you could put the cart so it wouldn't, you know, it might help a little bit if you angle it or, you know, sometimes you set it straight, but then I've seen it. That's just going to depend on what street you live on and which way your house yeah, faces. During a, during a summertime, you know, if you're on a, a street that faces the south, your lid's going to blow open. During the winter, if you face the north, it's going to blow open. Unfortunately, okay. it's really not uh, because we, we still need them facing the curb. If you right. turned it around to keep the lid closed, we're going to tear that lid up a lot sooner. Okay. If we uh, glue a little piece of two by four on top, are we going to get in trouble? That does not bother us at all. As long okay. as it's on the top, on the inside right. of the lid. Put on the, the inside? inside? On the inside of the lid. Okay. That'll hold it down a little better. What happens is, is if you put it on the outside of the lid, we go to pick it off and your glue breaks, I've got a smashed windshield on the side of the truck. Okay. okay. Possibly. Makes sense. So put it on the inside. All right. Okay. Yes, sir. Sense. Underneath yeah. the inside of the lid. Hmm. Okay. You can even put screws to the top. We're fine with that. That may that way it holds. <coughs> but on the outside, we prefer not to have anything on the outside of the cart because when we pick that up, it's going to come off at some point. Okay, good idea. So what's the uh, what's the life expectancy of those uh, automated trucks? I think you know if we get seven years out of them, we're doing good most of the time. Around five. Um, that arm's moving over a thousand times a day. When we developed the the rates. On the new system, we assume seven years. Okay. Your, uh, how's your tree limb collection efforts? Everybody pretty much in compliance, or we still have an issue? Yes, sir, we still have an issue from time to time. Um, and I will tell you, most of the issues that we have that deal with tree limbs are, is an education thing. Um, we get out as much as we can. We talk as much as we can. But there's a certain part of the population that's just really hard to reach. Um, so... You know, we've done UBO stuffers, we've done billboards, we've done TV commercials. Um, we've tried to address it in every way, but we still get those calls. I didn't know what to do. Um, and so we have to address those. But we're tagging them. Then they've got essentially 14 days to get it picked up before code enforcement actually takes any type of action. So once they get that tag, if they call us, we get it set up and, and it, gets, it gets picked up. You know, we have not been behind on our quarterly pickups. I mean, we've managed to stay. We're actually ahead right now. We were able to go in and pick up stuff in Green's Edition last week to make sure it didn't impede anything. Yeah, we, we asked Daryl to do a sweep of those areas we thought were going to flood just so there wouldn't be anything in the ditches, and they did a good job doing that. So, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else want to go? No. I don't think anybody's ready to go tonight. <laughs> They're all shaking their head no. <laughs> okay. So. No further well, business? Uh, no. Uh-uh. And remember, counsel, just if you have other questions, bring your binder with you. Well, we Ask again tomorrow night. Or call us. We're adjourned. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.